Awesome. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, and thanks, Matt, for getting that set up for us. So I'm going to just share a video very shortly, just so you can kind of see us while we introduce ourselves. And then we'll turn it off once we start the presentation, just because we are going to try and do a live demo and we don't want to uh, slow it down any more than necessary. So as Courtney said, my name is Christina Dietz and I'm presenting with Captain Kyle Baldia today. Well, I've been with the city for about a year and a half and I've worked on this project for about a year. And Kyle? Well, I've worked for the city for 24 years. Uh, when I first started working on this, I was a high rise captain um, out in our high rise district. Um, found a need so I got into this um, she Christina is my third GIS person that I've had to train on this so um, I've become well well understanding of what GIS is now you're like a GIS expert now <laughs> yes <laughs> all right so we'll go ahead and turn off the video and then we'll get started so today we're talking about our project we've been working with the fire department on the fire tactical response guide solution using ArcGIS online web apps Uh, so just kind of a big bit of a background on what a TRG is, uh, tactical response guys, this is more kind of Kyle's uh, neck of the woods, we call them TRGs for short or pre fire plans, Kyle, if you want to kind of explain what they are. So in the fire department, we do uh, risk analysis on our buildings. Um, not every building gets a TRG or tactical response guide or pre fire plan. Uh, but ones that have high risk assessments to it do so that when we do have a fire, then we can know before we go there where those problem areas are, where access points are, where knocks boxes are, so we can get the keys. If there's a hazmat um, portion of that building that we can be aware. And what we've done is put these maps out so that we can also study them before we go out there or when we do go out there for just training, we can look at them to be more familiar. Um, it's, it's very helpful for us for emergencies, obviously. They give us fire hydrant locations. Um, we wanted to go to, um, I needed, are we on the same one? Sorry. You wanna go to the next one? Yeah, no, we'll go, yeah, I'll put it on that one. Okay. Um, generally, we went to, we were originally with paper maps, um, where everything was written down, sent in, it would be months later before it was created. These were more of a cartoon map. They were high level, done really well, but they weren't something that we could do really fast. And it would be months before we get the data. Uh, we started getting high rise buildings and being a high rise captain. I needed to know what was on the 14th floor or the 15th floor of a 25 story high rise. And I needed something that could fit in my hand and not have to carry up a binder of papers. Uh, we have 13 city districts in Plano. So each fire department station has its own district. And we can't have um, these tactical response guides for each station in the, in the engine or the truck or the ambulance. Otherwise it would take up like a encyclopedia rack in the back. So I needed to find a way that was better to store that information. Sorry about that, I got us out of order here real quick. Sorry guys. Okay, from current slide. Perfect. Um, so we didn't build these for every building. We only did these for our, like he mentioned, our big buildings that are high rises, our big apartment complexes, nursing homes, schools, anything that would have a large impact on the community. And how we identified those was using a target hazard analysis. This is actually an Esri solution that's still out there. Uh, when we send out the slide deck, you'll get a link to it in case you want to look at doing something similar for your city. It's pretty simple uh, that I figured out on my own. So it, it should be user friendly, basically, is what I'm saying. Uh, it identified buildings that would have a life, loss of life or a negative impact on the community if there was a fire. So if there's going to be a large loss of life, a short, a small loss of life, it all scales these things and calculates a hazard score. It looks at the occupancy type, which is a school versus a nursing home versus a complex, an apartment complex, a storage building, things like that. The building size, it takes into square footage, number of floors, 
the life safety as well as the economic impact, which we use the appraised value from the appraisal district to calculate that. And that all goes into a hazard score that's totaled up and then we rank them. So there's a specific number we're looking for that we consider a max risk, which is the large buildings, the high rises, the apartment complexes, nursing homes. Then we have our high risk, which is smaller apartment complexes, maybe some duplexes, triplexes, things like that, schools. And then we've also got our standard response, which is normally residential or smaller businesses. And I think that just all goes into kind of what equipment needs to be provided. Right. So each response gets a different uh, response. So uh, if you have a regular house, you're only going to get so many engines in a truck, uh, a normal response. But if you're looking at a max response, you take looking at a high rise building or a large square foot, it may not be tall, but the square foot is the imprint, uh, the uh, footprint so big that it takes up a lot. You're gonna look at, you know, three trucks, five, you know, five or six engines, and it could be, you know, more. So we had to designate that for our CAD system. Um, so the, the hazard score was actually there before we actually even did the maps because they needed to know what response we're sending to this fire call. Um, whether it's just a standard house, whether it's a Home Depot, or maybe it's a 29 story high rise building. Okay. So again, just the paper maps and this kind of fed into our assignment process because these were all paper maps. It's data that actually uh, Kyle learned to do JS and create uh, the maps for us. We provided them the building footprints and the streets. But then once we had all the data in, we needed a way of updating the data and maintaining it, not just having stagnant data. So we looked into what we call the assignment process. And how this works is it helps the fire department maintain and update the information on a regular basis. This is by assigning each station and each shift. We have 13 stations, three shifts. So it's 39 different buildings we're looking at each month just to make sure we're staying on top of the data. We're making sure we're updating new buildings because we're constantly getting new apartment complexes at this point, new commercial buildings up in Legacy West. Yeah, Shops of Legacy. Yep, Legacy Shops of West, Legacy. Yeah. So we're always getting new improvements and upgrading it. So we previously, we, Kyle, previously <laughs> did this by hand. Uh, was it using Excel? You just looked at numbers or you looked at just pick the random building uh we we would pick buildings in our in our districts originally uh that we felt were large that would require a response plan that would require a tactical response guide that we felt were dangerous or that we would pre-plan it so a pre-plan go okay if there's a fire here these are the hazards to look out for this is where you would um get on the roof here because we know these hazards are on the roof like things even like air conditioners people don't understand if they're on the roof there's a fire below it's dangerous we need to know about those things that so that's the kind of pre-planning things that we were looking at there okay so but previously they didn't use any kind of target hazard analysis to no it was well, simply we that. go out to our district and say yeah that's dangerous let's go do a uh a paper map on that and send it in and we'll get it add to the map book maybe five you know five months later sometimes we did it multiple times i didn't get it um and that's when i was uh when i was tasked with i said hey i got this great idea let's go get a let's, let's put this on computer get a program and uh, we decided that i don't know if i'm jumping ahead or not no, okay fine. um even if you are it's fine <laughs> <laughs> we, we decided that hey i was tasked with okay find a program that can do this and everywhere I looked, it was everything was basing all their information off of Esri. They were just stealing that information from Esri and putting it into their little dashboard. So I said, well, why can't we just use Esri? 80% of the cities have Esri. Why don't we just use what the product they have and bypass the, you know, the middleman that's going to not want to do it the way I want to do it. Um, and that's why we decided to use Esri and started inputting all that information in they had a a a program that was kind of what we needed and then had to kind of reverse engineer to get it to what we needed yeah so previously it was all in excel and now we're using now we're basically i like to joke we're the esri poster child we use esri for everything our web maps our hubs things like that 
But so that's kind of the, the purpose of the assignment process is we're wanting to maintain the data and update it. And we've got over 3,500 buildings in Plano. So it's gonna take us a few years to get through it all. But we're now that we're getting in the process, we're in testing. Once people come more familiar with the software, we're hoping it'll be more than one assignment a month. Right. And it, it once you do your initial work on it, the upkeep is really easy. So once you get all the data in the system, then it's just a matter of updating it and updates. The, your biggest updates for us and our part is updating who's using the building, engineers, uh, office management and all that stuff. But most of the time, a fire alarm panel is going to stay in the same spot. Yeah, that makes sense. And then we've also added in not just the assignments, but once so we since we do monthly assignments, if they don't get to it that month, they still get a new assignment the next month. But that last month's assignment becomes delinquent. They become basically on the naughty list. It gets sent up the chain of the command and they figure out, OK, what's going on? Why aren't we getting this done? Do we need to change assignments? Things like that. And then they can still make edits outside of the monthly assignment. So if they're out on a call and they see something at not an emergency situation and they have time to sit there and take down that data, they can do it. Of course, as we go on and we show you a live demo, more of this will make sense. Yeah. So this is kind of where uh, Kyle was talking on updating to the original, uh, to Esri products from the original PDF data. Uh, we're using Esri web map applications adapted from an original Esri solution. So you kind of touched on, we reverse engineered it. They provided a us a solution and we tweaked it to fit our needs and what we were wanting it to look like. One of the problems that we ran into was we needed a secure map. We couldn't just have instant, here it is, put that information in there and it pops up on the map. Um, we needed a secure map for a for maybe if we're doing gate codes to apartments and then we needed a secure map that if someone accidentally put something in it wouldn't screw up the whole system because we're still even using those maps our, our Esri maps with all this ETRG data and putting it on our CAD map so it shows up actually on the screen uh, in the uh, cab of the apparatus so they can look at that and have good information there too so as we did a great job, oh, it's instantaneous, but that didn't work for us. So we had to go through three um, GIS people to figure out how to reverse it. And then on top of that, we've automated some of the processes for managing the data using Python scripts, communicate using those Python scripts to communicate the assignments up the chain of command so they know what's assigned that month to their station and their shift. They know what's delinquent and what's been completed that month. All of that's been automated in an email that we send out at the beginning of the month. We also track the progress throughout the month using Esri dashboards, just so they can kind of touch base, say, okay, what's been done this month? What hasn't been done? What do we have left to do? And then creating a central location to access all of that via an Esri hub, which is basically looks like a website. So just a quick, I don't want to dive too deep into the Python script because that's, I know that makes people snore sometimes, but uh, we have an hourly update script. So what we've done is there is a field in the feature classes because there's a feature class for all these and I'll show you all of this in the map. There's different feature classes that we're updating. There's a field that for new features is auto populated to ready for review. So we know that it can move on to the next phase of the review process. How it works is we have two sets of eyes looking at everything. We have an editor in the field and we have a coordinator in the office that's double checking the work just to make sure we're putting in valid data or maybe the location wasn't working on their device that day. And so we're updating it and making sure it's in the right spot. So we have a field that's marked ready for review and the hourly update script is looking at that field and making sure, okay, do we need to send this to coordinators? Do they need to be reviewing the data? And it's letting them know. And then we've got nightly updates, which pushes anything that's been completed that month or that day for that month assignment. It, it marks it as completed if it has been reviewed. It pushes that and it removes it from the list of what needs to be completed still that month. Then, of course, we've got weekly backups running just in case something happens. Nobody has the power to delete anything but the GIS analysts. However, we always do weekly backups just in case we lose any information that we didn't want to lose previously. So all these are monthly assignments and going up to the battalion chief, it's, 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 it's just having a 
a way to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, obviously, the fire department is very more like the military. And sometimes we don't always do what we're supposed to, but this stuff is important. So therefore, I, I tasked them with making sure that we email certain people when things weren't done so that we make sure it gets done. Um, and if sometimes things get you know, left out because we had a really busy week, that's okay, but we need to make sure we get back to it. So um, yeah, we had a lot, of, a lot of work getting all that stuff together because why do we need this? Well, we need to tell this person that it didn't get done so we can get it done. Wow. So then we also have our Hulk, our biggest Python script is our monthly assignment script. This is the assignments we're talking about that's auto assigning each building to a station and st shift each month. Uh, so it's 39 assignments a month, each station and shift getting a unique building. It's over 2,500 lines of code. It does prioritize based on the risk level. So our max level for buildings are going to get looked at first. And then after they've been looked at, it moves on to the date of the oldest data. It goes max to high and then standard. It looks for those in order of risk level. And then we also, if we've kind of built it modularly so that if we need to change the number of assignments each month, so say we, we've figured it out, we know how to use the app, we're only doing one assignment a month, but let's go ahead and move up to two. We have the time, we have the resources, we can do that in one spot. We don't have to go through all 2,500 lines of code to look for that value. Uh, it attracts both assignments and delinquencies. And like Kyle was mentioning, it emails it up the chain of the command just so everybody's accountable for what they are or aren't supposed to be working on that month. So we've got three Esri web mapping applications that we're looking at because I did mention we have several sets of eyes looking at this data. We wanna make sure it's all good quality data before we are finalizing it. So we've got our editor app. Uh, we're working for editing purposes only. These are the guys in the field, the boots on the ground. They are editing in this environment. Then we've got our coordinator. These are our office guys. They're reviewing and approving uh, the data that has been created in the field or edited in the field and then we've got our locator which is for viewing and navigation purposes so we're going to uh risk it for the biscuit here and try and do a live demo and cross our fingers everything works smoothly uh so this is our hub this was kind of designed just so they can go in one spot and find everything at the same place they don't have to go to five different websites to find their web map apps <laughs> so the uh, we've got our three web map apps that we're going to be showing you here. We've got a dashboard that shows you kind of an overall view, and I can kind of give you a screenshot of that later because it's not active right now because we're only in test environment. Um, we've got our out of service fire hydrants web map. This is just to kind of show them what, what fire hydrants to hook up to and what not to hook up to. Then we've got our overall dashboard. This gives them an a big overview of all of the buildings across the city. You can see we've got a lot. We do try and combine the apartments together in one assignment, but it does make them look like there's a lot of apartments. Uh, they can filter by their battalion, their station, and that'll filter the results for them, their shift, and all of this feeds off of each. So the battalion is only gonna show you what stations are in that battalion, but this is station 10. I wanna see this address, it zooms to it. So it's super user-friendly. We They really enjoy that aspect of things. You can still see some of the data. Then of course, we still have static maps because in case of an emergency, the towers go down, we don't have access to websites. These have all been printed and are still in the trucks? Yes, they're still in the trucks. But, all apparatus have manual paper map books. But this is where they can go to print off those maps ahead of time or view them beforehand if they need to. We even have late, here's the latest update so they don't have to reprint the whole map. They can just reprint the pages that have been updated. Our last update we ran here obviously was a long time ago because we've been focused on our digital version, but that is coming soon as well. And then they also have who to contact just in case they can't figure things out. They're not contacting me every time. They will contact their fire department technology uh, services and then if if it's not a user error or something that they can help them with then they'll pass it back on to me and then i'll figure out what's going on so for our locator map it's of course all blocked here locator 
All right, so this is our first map, our locator map. I just kind of had everything preloaded just so we don't have to waste time zooming to everything. So this is what the locator map looked like. This is the viewing map for viewing purposes only. Uh, we've provided them a search so they can search their address they need to go to um, over here. Then we've got our legend. It just tells them what all of this means. All these oranges, these are high response buildings. Then we've got green for standard, red for max response. You can see we've got some red over here for the bigger buildings, bigger impacts. Most of our max uh, requirements were anything over five, five stories and above were going to be a max. So a five-story apartment building in our in our city is considered a max risk. Yeah. And then you can see all the, obviously all the other layers that we have down there, park trails, fire districts. Let's zoom in a little because I know we've got some data. And these are the big layers where we've got all of our fire equipment, uh, our building access. And how we've designed it is this gray data is data that's been entered in the field, but has not been reviewed in the office. So that way they're still getting live access to the data, whether it's been approved or not. They just know the gray hasn't been approved yet. It just hasn't been reviewed. That's, yeah. It may not be anything wrong with it. Right, well, and we, and we did that because it hasn't been reviewed. So we're not gonna take it as it actually is. It could be correct but we're going to look at it with some skepticism versus anything else that is in color we know it's been reviewed it's good to go ready to go but we wanted this to have this ability so that if someone went out and found something you know five minutes ago we would say it'll still be able to access it it might be good information but knowing that it hasn't been approved yeah and then we've got our layers so they can always turn anything on and off as they see fit we even have our satellite imagery that they can turn on with our street labels so they can get the most up-to-date imagery that we have and we do use near map so it's as up-to-date as we can get at this point point. and then of course they can change the base map if they'd like but we want them to be able to toggle it on and off it just makes it easier for them to see and compare. Then after our locator, so this is our viewing map. It's only for navigating, find out where you're going. You can click on it and get all the information you need, but you can't edit in this environment. It only shows you the data. So then we have our editor. This is where the guys in the field can edit data. They can also, we have a web map for them to use field maps as well if they are more comfortable in that environment and that's what's working for them on their iPads in the field, or they can come back in the office and use this app. Again, they can search their address, but the color coding is a little different. There's no gray versus color. Uh, they use the legend to tell what, what is what item. Then of course, again, we've got our layers. They can toggle on and off our satellite imagery. They can toggle on and off. Then they're using the smart editor to edit data and I can kind of show you a really quick one uh, here in just a second. <clears throat> but you can see they can click on it edit the data as they see fit. And then we also even have the ability to attach photos and this case it was you know testing data, but they're attaching floor plans videos to access certain equipment. Can you go to 7200 Dallas. So we're gonna check out. You might want to do it in. The, uh, they would probably look at it there. So. Seventy-two hundred Dallas Parkway. Yeah. There we go. So what what we're gonna show you here is is this is a 20, 25 story high rise. It's our Legacy Kincaid building. Uh, one of the things that was important to me as a high-rise captain, and obviously, again, is knowing what's on each level of the floor. Um, so we, I was able to input all these floor plans in here. So being able to click on the sixth floor, this is the PDF. I made a PDF. I went there. The sales rep said, hey, this is what we have of our building. This is the sixth floor. Is a parking garage. Now above it is the residence, but up on the left side of this is a concrete structure, and on the right side is a basically a stick frame five-story 
uh, apartment, and on the left is this all is a commercial structure. And oh, how do I? I'm lost. Up here. Yeah, I know. Here, <laughs> it, it's because this thing's blocking. Um, okay. So back to where I was. So I'll pick a better one. We'll go to the 25th floor and look at the penthouse. So now we know on the 24th floor, 25th is actually the top of this one here, but we know these are the units in there. I know how big the units are. I know where their address is. That helps us for in fire and also helps us for our EMS. So if we get a EMS call that's 2424, we know where that unit is. After we get off the elevator, we know where to go. Um, it makes it helpful, super helpful in these high rise or really large buildings. All right, close that off. And I need to go back to that again. All right, whoops, that's okay. So that was one view I had. And then the other view was a more tactical view. Uh, go back one more. I keep picking six and that's the, not really great tactical when you're looking at a uh, parking garage. Uh, we'll go nine through 17. So nine through 17, I, our fire marshal office had blueprints of all the floors. So nine through 17, all these rooms are all made the same. Um, it's a sprinkler blueprint, but it really works for me because it gives me a blueprint. So now tactically I can say, hey, look, these are what the rooms look like. How many people I need to send down? How many people are gonna be on that floor? Hey guys, it's gonna be one main room, a sub room and a couple closets. That's what your rooms are gonna look like. So we can make it a tactical advantage of, we can attack the fire versus the fire attacking us. So that's really came in handy to be able to download photos, PDFs. We can do videos. One of our examples of videos is we have a, a water treatment plant that if you turn the valves all the wrong way, it dumps all the chlorine in, or if you turn it the right way, it shuts it off. So it's really important to have this uh, tactical information at our hand. And this Esri program was able to do that. And we're really excited about that. So the attachments obviously are super important. Uh, it really helps them in that sense. So what basically he, we can go in, edit any data. It doesn't even have to be assigned that month. They can, you can see they're using smart editor to edit everything as well. Let's close that out because that's the old location I was looking at. Um, so then we could even add points and we've even added in some cool little, I don't wanna say it's a feature, it's just ways we've manipulated it to do what we needed to do. If they create this, say they put stairs and they put it in the wrong place, we, can also, they can't, they don't have the access to delete data, but they have access, we've created a field ready to delete. And that way it flags it for a coordinator to review in case they put something on accident. And so in this case, say we save it, okay, the stairs show up in the middle of the road. Obviously that's the wrong place. Now they could edit the geometry and move it if they so chose to, or they can mark it for deletion. And it, Hide, we've created a definition query where it'll hide it from the map. So we're not cluttering up the map as they're accidentally creating features. Now that doesn't delete the data, it pushes it on to the person in the office reviewing it, but that at least keeps it from cluttering their map. You can see it quickly becomes overwhelming once we have all of the data entered for these buildings. Then we've also added in a filter so that they can look for their assignment each month. Everything's bro broken up into building information, which is our building specifically, or our complexes, which are more like apartment complexes, storage complexes, things like that. So in this case, our testing data is still, I think it's in station eight, and it'll show us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this shows you all the assignments for that month. It looks like we've been playing with data. Get a lot of assignments. Oh, because I didn't mark assigned. Thank you. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> so you do have to mark assigned because delinquent is also an option. So it defaulted to unassigned. So let's go to assigned. There we go. That looks more like what I was expecting. Um, so you can click on it. It'll zoom to that assignment. In this case, there's only one assigned right now just because we're still in testing phases, but they will have all of station eight listed out here and they can then zoom to their specific battalion, their specific shift, if it's assigned versus delinquent. If it's delinquent, I believe it shows up red. 
And so we've added that feature. And so that is our editing environment. Then we've also got our coordinators. These are the guys and women in the office that are reviewing data that's been entered in the field. So if we went, what was that address again? 7200. 7200. North Dallas Parkway. North Dallas Parkway, which is where we just were. Of course. Dallas. There we go. I forget. So you can see that stairs we just created didn't get deleted and now it's ready for me to review. I look at it, say ready for review, yes, delete entry. Okay, they accidentally put this, obviously it doesn't belong there. I can use the smart editor and do, do, do. I can say, okay, it's ready to publish. I've reviewed it, That's it's an, a deletion. It will again, hide it from the map. It doesn't delete the data. My script that runs every night will remove anything that's been marked for deletion, looked at by two different sets of eyes and good to go. They can also create data if they want to create data. They have the power to do that in case maybe they were in the field writing everything on the paper and they want to bring it into the office and digitize it. They can do that here as well. Again, they have the layer list, the legend. Their widgets are a little different. This is looking at all the different layers of data they have. They've got alarm control panels they're accessing and editing, building access, building equipment, uh, our fire suppression systems, and all these different layers that they're responsible for seeing what we've is ready for review. So these, in this case, this is our test, some of our test data that's going. This is ready for review. It zooms to it, highlights it. You can look at the data. And if there's anything that needs to be edited, they can always edit that. So you zoom in, click on the feature that shows you all the data, and then use Smart Editor again. So that's how our coordinator, editor, and locator maps all work. I did show you the hub and the dashboard, so I think we're all good there. This is our other dashboard. This is the high level status updates. They can say what's ready for review, what's ready to publish. This is what's ready to review and publish across the city. Again, it, our live demo just won't work right now because we're still testing. So this is what it looked like previously when we did have data ready. So we've been, so some of the challenges, I'm sure Kyle talked to this a little bit. We've gone through getting the original data into the JS format. Uh, how long did that take you? A mm, couple months. So it took a couple months of dedicated 40 hours a week or more um, than 40 hours uh, a week? Well, well, it depends. I mean, cleanup took me more. <laughs> but uh, original original data that we got was just we, we had our old maps and we sat down at the computer and we took our old maps and we put all that information and digitized it. And I, I, I probably about, I, we had a lot of information to start with. We, our city had a lot of good maps and good stuff. So it took probably about four or five months to put okay. all that information in there. Um, but as I started getting more people to help me, it, it obviously made it faster. Uh, but then again, to our next one, the project changing GIS analyst hands um, on my third, breaking my third one in, but she's not allowed to go anywhere. because <laughs> You know, uh, all of them, all, all my GIS people that I had were fantastic. Um, and everyone got us to a different step because, you know, all the stuff that we're doing, you know, she's showing all the, all the coding and everything. I did all that stuff by hand because I wasn't smart enough to, I don't know coding. So I was doing emailing stations. We were doing three a month. I was going through and I was, I was doing all this by myself, knowing that eventually we would get to it where we could be automated. So I'm really, really thankful for the fact that we're able to get it automated now. Um, and like I said, every, every GIS person I had has got me to this point, but I also had to break every single one of them in when they said like, what are you doing? We're reverse engineering. Well, it's supposed to work this way. No, I know, but I need it to work this way. And we all brought in our own ideas. And so sometimes, he had, like he said, he had to move backwards and say, well, this is why we're doing it this way. And so he had to do that three different times. Yeah, understanding why we do what we do. Um, we're, we're, we're a different entity. You know, we look at things different than general population does. You know, we're not just trying to put information, instant information out there. We need accurate information, life-saving information. So that's why, you know, as we originally developed this to be 
just one, you know, one layer. And now we've got how many multiple layers, duplicate layers, um, backup layers, uh, you know, especially I know it was really difficult, you know, getting photos on one layer and then transferring them to the other other side of things and getting that to work. That was a really huge hiccup, but a great, great thing that this program does. So, um, yeah, we try to make a, a block fit in a round hole, but it's now a block, so it works. We just shrunk the, the <laughs> block to fit in the hole. <laughs> but in that, and everything with the city, there's always a lot of politics and hands in the honey pot, and everybody wants it to look a specific way. And so I, having to bring all of those great minds together and compromise on one single vision, I think was a lot of the slowdown as well. It, this has been, I think, three years in the making. Four. Say, what's the year is it? I started in 2019. So it's been a few years and in our hands, it wasn't that long. In the GIS hands, it was only like three years. But one of those years, I think there was a pause due to COVID. Yeah, there was a huge pause during COVID. And like for a full, well, it wasn't a full year. I mean, I, I researched for a good six months and started finding the stuff. And that's when we got on with David and started with that. And then, you know, problem solving. Uh, so if any of your cities want to do this, this is something I mean, we have done. There's so much research and problem solving done in what we've done here that we anyone that's starting this is got a head start because we've we've made a lot of the got a lot of the research done. Yeah, leaps and bounds. And so kind of where we're at now, we've created training videos for the fire department so they can disseminate. They don't have to get everybody in one room and try and reconcile and get everybody understanding the same thing, as well as currently testing phase for a few months. So that's what we're gonna to continue to work on. The, we, good timing, I went out on maternity leave in the middle of the testing. So they've got a couple months left and then they're going to continue to evaluate and we will provide upgrades as they come through and if we need to make changes. And then after that, I think we're gonna come up within the next month or two, it's gonna go live and it, it'll be hopefully, fingers crossed, working smooth as butter. There you go. So I, that's it from our end. Did y'all have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Christina and Captain Baldia. Um, we actually do have a, a handful of questions here in the chat box. If, uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and uh, start at the top and read them off to you. Uh, Courtney asks, how do you document if the building has had a fire or burned down? Uh, we, we don't actually. Uh, that is not part of the process that we, that's not part of the data that we collect here in Plano. Um, if it's burned down and no longer there and it's a new building, then uh, if we go out, when we do our, our inspection we, we drive our districts constantly and we find something that's not on the map anymore then we send that information up and then uh christina would delete that from the um from the map but our guys don't have the power to delete that because we didn't want them accidentally deleting you know random random buildings that we need sure okay great uh, so tim asked how many times on the uh, quote naughty list before an item is addressed so right now, as soon as something's marked delinquent, it's sent up the chain to the command, and I'm hoping they're going to be contacting. Well, so as, as it looks right now, so if you didn't do your, if, if you didn't do your um, assignment, your assignment, your TRG, then at the end of the month, it sends out a email to the battalion chief who is supposed to overlook that. And it also goes up to the deputy chief who is over both battalions. We have two battalions here in East and West side. So then it gets addressed that way. Um, the biggest thing to keep them accountable is they don't, they still have to do it the next month. And there are good reasons not to be able to get it done. Um, but then again, there's sometimes there's not just like everyone else in every other industry, there are lazy people. And that's why we had to do that to make sure. So it's really only one time you're on the naughty list and get it done. So it doesn't really roll over into months or anything like that. It's at the end of the month, you're on the naughty list if you didn't get it done. Okay. Um, so next question here is uh, Catherine asks, how do you keep up with the latest updates? Is that automated where a particular grid is tagged with when it was last updated or is it a manual process? 
So the latest updates as in adding in new buildings is on the GIS end of things. We're kind of, we're in pocket kind of with the planning department. So we, we see when things are coming through, such as like the new HEB building coming in, we're super excited about. We're, we're already tapped in to know all of that. As to keeping up with the latest updates on the buildings, I think that's just working through the script. It, go, it looks within that district, it looks for the max, max risk buildings first and it goes down the line to high and then standard. I think that answers your question, Catherine. We don't use a grid. Okay, um, if, you know, thank you. Uh, so oh, Tim okay, asked- Hold on, sorry, she, she did, re she just uh, re latest updates on PD fire response maps, PDF map books. Uh, so that is basically, if there's something that's outdated and they bring it to my attention because the maybe the PDF hasn't been re-exported, it's just I think on a as we find it basis, and then we push it through to the hub where we have the latest updates PDF I was showing you, and that's just sent out and updated. Yeah, so new streets that get added, they'll say, "Hey, I got this new streets on the map." They'll send that up through the uh, web the portal, and that will get disseminated to GIS and they'll they'll add it that way. That's how we do it. Sorry, Matt, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, 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 that's wonderful. And Catherine said, I followed up with a thank you. Awesome. Um, so uh, back up the list here, uh, looks like we have another question from Tim asking uh, what device is being used to edit in the field, a phone, a tablet, etc." Both. Yeah. Both. They can, we have phones on our engines or our, engines and trucks and ambulances. We have phones on our apparatus and we have uh, iPads on our engines. We've been training on the iPads and that's where we're using the field maps more so than the uh, web mapping apps that I just showed you. The field maps is just very edit and move on. You don't get the filters and things like that. Okay, super. Um, so on down the list here, Eric asks, what symbol set did you use, Esri, Custom, or NAPSG? I believe these were custom. They were somebody, 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 somebody had created in the PDFs and we had to recreate the symbols as JPEGs or TIFFs and then we added them to our map. I'm not sure if he went off a certain standard or if he made them up himself. I think it was kind of both the original, our original map maker, maker guy. Um, and so what we had to do is we wanted it to be as familiar to the firefighters out there as possible. We wanted to remove too much strange and weird. You know, uh, we still had a lot of older captains that don't even like using electronics, believe it or not. Um, not that I'm young, but I don't have a problem using electronics. Uh, <laughs> but they were adverse to new things and change that way. So we wanted to keep it as comfortable as possible. Obviously, now with a new... Um, the younger force that keeps coming up and obviously all the older guys are retiring it it's a lot easier for them now but that's why we have the symbology that we have okay makes sense yeah thank you um so you are getting a number of kudos here a lot of people thank you and saying what a great job this is and uh, what an excellent presentation uh but we'll continue on with the questions here uh, so holly asks how do you secure your data so it's available to those who need it and not accessible to the public good question well, we do have it secured through our secured services using the Esri server. And then we have named users logging in and accessing this data. Okay. Uh, I think in the, the next question is actually an extremely close follow-up, I believe. So from Sam asks, how do you deal with city network access? We use single sign-on for our enterprise, but outside the network, that doesn't work. Correct. We don't use single sign outside of the network. They are still having to use those user accounts to log in. So it's secured via the what devices we're using because they are logging in each time to access the data. And we don't have to have the single sign on on the tablets or the phones. Yeah, because that makes it really hard for us on an emergency call to get stuff. We have to do the dual access. It slows it down for sure. Okay, great. Uh, so that is for the moment, the end of the questions that we have in the chat box. If anybody does have any further questions, uh, here's one right here uh, from Tarek. Have you considered using indoor mapping? 
So yes, and and what we looked at is how how user friendly is that going to be to us, and what in in the idea of this project that I had. Um, interiors still do change quite a bit uh, on businesses, and that's what you're going to do. So I mean, I liked having a base. Um, um, outline of the interior, knowing that that still could change. So the technology wasn't there to make it quick enough or easy enough, if that makes any sense, to put interiors in. When it becomes something that is just like a couple strokes or in a couple lines of code to do, then it's not a problem. But right now it's pretty complicated. Um, I'm hoping that maybe in you a know, couple of years, maybe three years, that that is something that we could use that would be easy to add and but then again we still have to look at how much data and how much space that takes up is it worth the space that it's taking up to put all that information in there and is it going to slow the system down at all okay um so again if you have any further questions please put them in the chat box um please unmute yourself and feel free to ask uh, ask ask uh, uh, vocally um we have about eight minutes left so we have plenty of time So I'll go ahead and squeeze one in here. Uh, Captain Valdia, what was your experience in terms of um, planning and buy-in from the stakeholders in the city and, and from, you know, from, your, uh, from your fire staff and things like that in terms of getting this whole project together? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so originally we put it in our, our, our five-year plan of things we have to do in the fire department each, you know, we have a, a, our projected, what we're gonna do year one, year two, year three. And it was given to us by our, our fire chief and command staff that we were gonna start making sure we were getting these uh, tactical response guides done. And I came up with my brilliant idea at the same time that this was going on. There's like, here, you're in charge. So that's how I got put into it. So that's how they gave me buy-in is they bring up a good idea and you get to do the work. Um, so I was actually, I was actually injured during this time. I was um, carrying a patient down the stairs and hurt my back and I was on light duty. Uh, so I was saying, hey, how can I make my job for my guys better? I had a need. So that takes into account making things better and having a need. That's where we got the, a lot of the buy-in. And when you, we never used to have high rises. Now we have at least 10 high rises and more going in. And they really saw the need. We weren't looking at one or two story buildings. We have five story apartment conglomerations now. They're huge, lots of people. So the buy-in came as, hey, we have a need. We need this information. What kept the buy-in going was now we have digital access. We can look at overhead views. Uh, I've been told multiple times, hey, I didn't know that building had uh, solar panels on it. I mean, and that's a huge thing to know in the fire service, access and things like that. So the ability to do videos. Um, I went out, once I started developing this with um, our GIS's help, I started showing our crews, hey, this it can do this. I had one part of our town that has um, a park and they were able to put symbology on the park to map where there were certain signs. So when people call in, hey, I'm by trail marker such and such, now we can just look at that and we know where to go. Because we do a lot more calls now and we don't stay in our district. We might have a, a engine from the east side coming to the west side to take care of a call. Now they have all that information digitally in front of them. That, that was the buy-in. Um, the buy-in and doing the mandatory going through this you have those that are like yes this is cool this is information i love what i do i'm going to get all that information and then you have those that obviously that's just one more thing i have to do my job is to save lives right so that's where the buy-in wasn't buy-in is like you're going to do this and that's why we had the so-called naughty list um and once i showed my bosses hey this is the program we need to go with plus i worked with my assistant chief in this a lot and he is a a great techie, um, it was pretty easy. Does that answer everything or is there anything else? I yeah, can no, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's great. And uh, it's, I'm glad to see you guys are having such success with this. Oh, also it's part of the successes. Our police department didn't have anything like this and they loved it. They're like, give us more. 
uh, they wanted to, so one of the big things is in apartments. In our original map, we had apartment maps that gave the unit number so we know where to go for a call. Um, police didn't have that. And now we digitize it, they had it too. They're like, yes, give us more, we love this. So it, it's been really helpful. And they've definitely started looking at it and they're like, okay, what can we do for our department? And they're wanting to do something very similar. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I guess we'll continue on here. We have another question uh, from Raphael. And he asked, do you have a special treatment for basements or sublevels? Uh, no, not a special treatment. In the uh, smart editor, it has a list and it'll say, what, ask you, does it have a basement on it? And you can click on, yes, it has a basement. Um, it would be something that we would put, you know, obviously, PDF wise to show in there. We could mark it uh, with basement, but our department decided we didn't want to mark it that way. But if you looked at your, your floor plans for each level, you would see that there was a subfloor or how many subfloors that you have. But that would be something you could completely do if, you, if they wanted to do. Previously, we did have a field for basement and we decided, the department decided to take it out too, like you said. Right. All right. Great. It looks like we got about uh, three more minutes here. We got a couple of uh, comments here from uh, uh, Mesquite trying to do a lot of the same things for our public safety team. So there's some uh, some neighbor cities that are working on similar uh, technologies. Um, so we do actually have, uh, I think this probably be our last question. Um, any advice uh, from Molly, any advice for those of us not getting far with trying to talk police or fire into using GIS app for collection and such? come visit us, bring their fire department, say, hey, uh, they're doing it this way. Can you come visit us and we'll show you how we're doing it. Um, that's That would be the best way because once they see it, they'll be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, we need to do that. Okay, uh, I guess kind of follow up to that is Richard asked, uh, do y'all have any documentation for this process? We are working on documentation. I feel like that's always the thing that falls to the end of a project. <laughs> But we are working on documentation. It won't be detailed. It'll just be kind of like, this is our solution. This is what runs. This is our hourly update. This is our web app. But it doesn't, it does not document how we set things up. I think that's all kind of where, that's why I have my contact information. If you have questions, I'm super happy to help you set it up on your end. And like Kyle said, I think the best way to spread the word is just sh showing them and looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Molly says uh, she's going to send this video to her local first responders as a starting point. So maybe they'll get oh, some. Uh, that's maybe they'll get a some great spark. idea. They can yeah. reach out to me. Reach out to me is no problem. I'm happy to send them in the right place. Um, you know, I do a lot of that. The fire department, uh, like I guess most city city other city businesses do. We don't care. We share. You know, it's not proprietary. We don't care. We want everyone to have the best. And then there's sometimes I go to other cities and get information from them. So especially fire. I don't know how police is. I couldn't tell you. I mean, we get along with our department, but I don't know what they do. But fire department, we share stuff all the time. All right. Uh, well, it's 12.59. So uh, we typically like to honor everybody's time and end right at one. Um, I guess to close out, thank you again, Christina and, uh, and Captain uh, Baldia. Uh, there are a couple QR codes here on the on the bottom, uh, of course, left and right there. So if you want to uh, go ahead and scan those or go to the go to the U.S. of Texas website, um, there's more information there on volunteering and uh, and, and and other things like that. So um, I guess that that's all uh, from my end. Christina, do you have any closing notes? No, thank y'all for having us. We're super happy to share, and hopefully, some other cities can start adopting something similar. Okay, super. Great job today. I saw, I think, up to 81 on my end of attendees. That's super exciting. I was excited to have everybody. All righty, that concludes. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Thank y'all.